Well, good morning, church. Let's all stand together. We're going to lift our voices, lift our hearts to the Lord. We're going to sing Mary's song this morning. It goes like this. Good news of great joy for every woman, every man. This will be a sign to you, a baby born in Bethlehem. Come and worship, do not be afraid. A company of angels, glory in the highest, and on the earth a peace among. His favor rests. Come and worship. Do not be afraid. There you go. My soul, my soul, magnifies the Lord. My soul, magnifies the Lord. He has done great things for me. Great. For the great things you've done in my life. Thank you for the great things you've done in all of our lives. You're so good and we honor you this day. You are worthy of praise. Unto you a child is born. Sing it out. Unto you a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Let every heart prepare his throne. Let every nation under heaven come and worship. Do not be afraid. My soul, my soul, magnify. Magnifies when you focus on him. My soul, my soul, focus on him. Magnifies the Lord. Like you're looking through a magnifying glass, put your eye on one spot. My soul, my soul, focus. Magnifies the Lord. He has done great things for us. He has done great things for us. He has done great things. done great things for us. My soul, let's sing it together. My soul, my soul, magnifies the Lord. Again. My 
Father, we focus on you this morning, peering closely into you, blocking out those things around us that are distractions from you. Holy Spirit, help us to do that. Help us to do that, Holy Spirit. Celebrate you, Lord. Celebrate you, Jesus. You know this. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Sing it out. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven. Sing, sing, sing. Joy to the world. You got that part? We will sing, sing, sing. The Savior reigns. Joy. Sing it out. Here we go. Joy to the world. The Savior reigns. Let man their song.
we light the candle that represents joy. The idea of joy or rejoicing is a constant theme throughout the Bible. It's prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah. David writes about it. Solomon laments that it seems hard to find. Zephaniah writes about God's joy as God sings over us. And Jesus said this in John 15, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Doesn't that sound amazing? Amen. Complete joy, and not just human joy, Jesus joy, heavenly joy, divine joy. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we think about you coming to be with us as one of us, the sheer wonder of it all wells up inside us. Somehow the idea of having complete joy, which sometimes seems impossible, seems more realistic when you are in the equation. This morning, Lord, we pray that you would make our joy complete, that your joy would live inside us like the Holy Spirit lives inside us. Lord, we pray that your joy will be evident in how we live and how we love. We pray that the gospel will be preached in our actions that your love will be shared throughout the day by how we treat others. You said, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. This morning, we ask that as we love you and love other people, your joy would grow in us and consume us completely. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
Son of Mary. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross that cleanses us of sin so that we can enter your presence and know the living God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Adore. Let's sing it together. It goes like this. Adore.
presence. We welcome you. Speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Open our ears. Open our eyes, Lord God, to what you have to say to us. Thank you. You are worthy of our praise. Thank you for being here and inviting us in. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. You may have a seat. What a beautiful time of worship and adoration. I just, I love the psalm. Psalm 100 says, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. We did that this morning. I want to welcome you all. My name is Marian Gaiman. Thank you to those of you who have uh, come to Hopewell this morning. To those of you online, welcome to you as well. Uh, if you are new and this is your first time here with us, we want to say a special welcome. Uh, at the bottom of your bulletin, there is a spot for you to uh, just to complete, to give us a little more information about you. There's a, a place there's called the Welcome Center. On your way out, you can drop that off. Off and we have a gift for you as well. If you have any prayer requests, on the other side of your bulletin, there's a spot for you to fill that out as well. We have a prayer team who would love to uh, raise your prayer requests up to our Father. Also, uh, if you are not receiving our regular e-bulletin, there is a spot if you have the church app on our phone, you can go on that, hit connect. There's also a spot you can see there on our church website. It is very easy. It's right on the home page. It's on the top left corner, and it just says click here. Um, I tried it. It is very easy, and I am technologically declined. So if I can do it, I am sure you can too. It's very easy to, uh, to go on there. And uh, I do notice that for me, I don't receive my Hopewell e-bulletins in my regular mail. It actually comes in under my promotions section. So if you're not receiving the emails um, in your regular, try a different folder. It might be coming in that way. So uh, we want to um, help you be connected here with what's going on at Hopewell. So that's one way to do it. Uh, if, you are come, if you came today to give and prepared to give, we want to say thank you so much. There's some ways that you could do that. One is there's boxes in the back. Uh, two, you can go through our app or again on our website and um, you can give that way and we want to say thank you. A couple things that we also want to bring to your attention. Uh, there's two families that we know of here in our church, Hopewell Church family, who have lost loved ones this week. One is Scott and Janet Cayley. Janet's father passed away this week. And also, Rob and Michelle Latofsky, Rob's father, passed away this week as well. So we want to um, just... Remember those families in our thoughts and our prayers. Um, so let's just uh, bow our heads. Dear Lord God, you are the giver of all gifts, and we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. We thank you for um, those who uh, are prepared to give today. We say thank you for their offerings, and Lord, for those families in our church who are grieving this week. God, we are just placing them in your loving arms. God, we just pray for your comfort, for your peace that passes beyond all understanding. When we don't understand it, God, we are just trusting in you. Please surround these families, their children, their grandchildren with your comfort and your peace and your love and give them wisdom, discernment as they move forward um, um, today and the days to come. And we just uh, place them in your, in your loving hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, um, on a, a good note, during the month of December, we have free hot chocolate available in the lobby. You can get that. Uh, please don't leave right now to do that. 
<laughs> I mean, you could, but, you know, uh, actually, after the service, uh, that's available to you. So uh, if you are in fifth or sixth grade, uh, now's your time to get up. Um, I don't know, maybe, I doubt that you should take a detour to the hot chocolate, but, but uh, again, enjoy uh, your time with uh, the, the awesome teachers who prepared a lesson for you. Um, let's see. And I think that's it. I think we've covered it all. Uh, for my portion of the announcements, uh, if you could turn your attention to the screens, have a wonderful day. Thank you again for being here at Hopewell with us today. Good morning, Hopewell. We have some great ways for you to connect around here. A new women's Bible study is starting up in January 2022. This study is on the book of Elijah. Women are invited to attend and be invigorated by Elijah's story. This seven-week series explores how the emboldened faith you desire is being fashioned by God in your life right now. You can register online today. For more information, contact Holly Lewis. Our app is the best way to stay connected with what's going on at Hopewell. You can download it for any device. You can get a quick preview of some upcoming events, browse our sermon archives, read the Bible, connect through our e-bulletin, see a full list of events, and give of your tithe and offerings. You can also receive notifications of closure in case of inclement weather as we get deeper into winter. It's a great resource whether you're new to our church or a longtime member. To learn more about what's happening at Hopewell, Check out the bulletin or visit hopewellchurch.org. And remember, live well, love well, hope well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if we could, before we jump into the word, let's just uh, posture our hearts uh, before the Lord to receive from him. So, Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that, God, you've been revealing yourself to us for so long, making your heart known to us through your written word, and through the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. And so we just bow before you. And so you would speak to our hearts, Lord. We humble ourselves before you. We bless you. Just bless this time together in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, today, if this is your first Sunday here, or maybe it's been a little while, we are in part three of our Advent series, which we have called Love Made Known. And we are actually... Uh, instead of doing a, looking at the Advent series through a traditional Christmas story, we're looking at this uh, Advent season through the eyes of the Apostle John and his letter that he wrote called, just called First John. And, um, and it's, it's a different way of, of doing an Advent series. But we thought this is important because traditionally over Advent, we look at the story of Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds, and the wise men. And, and we'll be looking at those things a little bit too as we go through the season. But that's more the story about how Jesus came. What we're talking about in 1 John is the reason why Jesus came in the flesh. Now, uh, the youngest of Jesus' disciples was the Apostle John. And a lot of people believe that he was probably around 16 or 18 years old when he started following Jesus. So some of you 16, 18 year olds, uh, that's how old Jesus, or John was when he met Jesus. Uh, so he wrote this letter to a group of followers or possibly the churches that he helped plant. And he wrote this also later in his life. So by this point, John is an older man. And it's interesting, isn't it, that if you read the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, where, where do they pretty much all start? They kind of start with the nativity, the traditional nativity story of the manger and, and the wise men and Mary and Joseph and all of that. But John, who knew Jesus very well, when he was writing his Gospel, as he was led by the Holy Spirit, he said, you know what, I'm going to go back a little farther than that. And he went back a lot farther than the beginning of, of the, the traditional Christmas story. Here's what he said in his gospel. In John 1, he said this, in the beginning, that's about as far back as you can go, isn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created, and in him was life. And that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. This is probably my, one of my favorite five verses in all of the Bible because it's just like, wow, there's such, it's beautifully written, but it also paints a picture for us that describes who Jesus really is. 
You know, he, he is the word of God made flesh. And, and he, he was there with God in the beginning, and he was God. He's trying to d- distinguish these things. And so Jesus is everything God wanted to communicate to us about him. He is his logos, the word, communication to us. It's all found in Jesus. And in a sense, right there, there was darkness. And I don't know that, I don't think that John's talking about physical darkness. I think he's talking about spiritual darkness. Um, the light of Christ has nothing to do with photon particles. The light of Christ, he says right here in this passage, the light of Christ was what? Life. It was life. Then John goes on to tell us the purpose of the light. Number two, verse 12, it says, To all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be what? Children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. So what John's trying to tell us all here is that every single human being on the planet Earth who was born was a spiritual orphan. We were alone. How many of you know that today, in this day and age, a lot of people struggle with loneliness? Probably, probably all of us in this room have struggled with it from time to time. Maybe you're struggling with it right now. But a lot of us struggle with loneliness. And if you think about it, how much does our society try to create a substitute way of dealing with loneliness. So much of what we do is trying to say, okay, I don't want to feel alone. I mean, look at social media. Like, what, A lot of people are involved in social media. That's a way of feeling connected, but is it really connectedness? And so what John is saying here is that God stepped into our situation and solved the problem of loneliness, if we would just let him. He didn't just visit our orphaned world and give us a meal and pat us on the back and say, off you go. Now, what did he do? He came and he adopted us. He made us children and, 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 and given us a sense of belonging. Now, I just want you to keep all of this in mind now as we go back to John's letter. Now, if you were with us last week, uh, the, the Apostle John really addressed some important things to the church. And he said, uh, you know, in the first week, he said, you're, you're to, if, you are, if there is sin... You're to confess your sins. And he really addresses the problem of sin. Is that we remember we have to remember that when we have problems in this life, whether it's anxiety, fear, sickness, uh, our bank account, whatever it is, that's not our main problem. The main problem is and always has been the problem of sin. But Jesus stepped into our world and took care of sin. But then John says this. He says, and if anyone does sin, remember I said that last week, if anyone does sin, and this is, again, one of the most powerful phrases to me in the Bible because this isn't God giving us permission to sin. He's just saying, if anyone does sin, then John goes on to say, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will defend us. His blood defends us. His blood doesn't just cover our sins. It cleanses us of our sins. And that is incredibly powerful. And if Jesus showed us this kind of remarkable love on the cross, then what John was saying is that we should then be compelled to show that same kind of love in return. So that's what we talked about last week. So now let's jump into our text today. First John, I'm going to start in chapter 2, verses 18. You're welcome to follow along in your own Bibles or your phone, but we're on the screen here. John says this. He says, children, remember he, that's a phrase he uses a lot. He's affectionately talking to his listeners. He says, it is the last hour. The hour is late. Now, this term in the Greek does not mean a literal one-hour period of time. It just means it's a period of time. We don't know how long the hour is. It just means that we are in the last stage of time. So my point number one is this, is that we are living in the last hour. And I, I like to think of it like this. Some people, one person said, you know, we're, it's the fourth quarter of the football game. And that, that's kind of the way they like to think of it. I don't like to think of it that way because in a football game, when you're watching how much longer there's, the time is left in the game, what do you look at? The clock, right? There's a clock that's ticking. But you, you know when that clock gets to zero, the game's over. I, I actually think a better analogy is not a football game because we don't have a clock. We don't see the clock. We don't know how much time there is left. It's more like a baseball game that goes to extra innings. You know, where it's like that game could end with one swing of the bat, and there is no clock in baseball. Do you ever think about that? It's just the game goes on and on and on until the final at-bat happens, and someone hits a home run or the game-winning hit. And that, to me, is what it's like 
for uh, us living in this day and age is that we are living in the extra innings stage of humanity. We're in that last hour. Now, we don't know exactly when it's going to end there, and only God knows the clock. But we don't know when that, when that last at-bat's going to happen. Jesus is returning, but we don't know exactly when. Now, I remember uh, a number of years ago, um, my wife was on, on a local uh, board, and she had a meeting. She said to us, this is going to be a long meeting, and she, just, she warned us ahead of time. And she said, make sure the kids are in bed by 9 o'clock, and that they've showered and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. And so I'm thinking, like, she'll be gone three, four hours, and, and so i got plenty of time here. So we, uh, as a good father, I, uh, it was movie night, and, um, and so we had popcorn and pizza and sodas, and we're, we're having fun. We're watching the movie and, and uh, having a great time, and then it's getting close to 9 o'clock, and I, and I said to the kids, all right, we should probably turn this off, pause this, and maybe finish it tomorrow. And, of course, they're like, Dad, there's only, like, 25 minutes left. Let us stay up. And I was like... Fine, and I knew it would take us past 9 o'clock, so we stayed up past 9 o'clock. And then we hear this noise. And uh, we, we recently got our garage doors fixed, but before we got our garage doors fixed, it was like trucks downshifting on the highway, like, you know, just making this terrible noise, and it just reverberates through the whole house. And so I'm like, and so the blood drained from my face, and I'm like, Mom's home. And, and they're like, what? And so we, we, you know, I turn the TV off. And I'm like, grab everything. So they're all grabbing the junk food and the, the bags and the soda cans. And they're, we're, it's like a mad scramble. And we're all running upstairs. And then and, and Maria walks in. And she just we make eye contact. And I'm like, I'm dead. You know, because I knew, I knew I messed up. And I did. And she was right to be upset. And then she didn't even have to say anything. I'm like, just kind of like, like this. <laughs> and, and, and I was thinking, you know what? That's a lot like how a lot of people in our, in our world treat the return of Jesus. And we think we've got time. We think that we were like, well, I'll know, I'll know right about, like as if we have some kind of precognition, like I'll know right when he's about to come, and I got time to clean up my mess. But that's not how it works, is it? The Bible says he'll come like a thief in the night. Like you won't know. You won't hear the garage door opening. You won't even have that time to like get things ready. We are living in the last hour now, but we are listening for the sounds. God does speak in his word about the things to pay attention to and the birth pains and to listen. The last hour began when Jesus dealt a death blow to the work of Satan on the cross. That's when it began. Again, we don't know how long it will last. It will end at Jesus' second coming, but you don't want to get caught with trash in your hands. You don't have to. When Jesus returns... He will usher in his new kingdom, which is good news. But there will be someone else who comes during the last hour, and John addresses that. Then right away he says this. He says, and you have heard that Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. By this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. So let's just stop here for a second. Who is the Antichrist? You ever want, people ask that question all the time. The Antichrist is kind of like, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a bad person. That's a crazy term. And, and, uh, but who is the Antichrist? Well, here's what the term means. Antichrist just means this, against Christ or in the place of Christ. A lot of people think of it just as the first, that the Antichrist is the, the one who is battling Jesus. But it also means the person who tries to take the place of Christ. Did you know that the Apostle John's the only one to use this phrase in the Bible? Actually, a lot of people think that he actually made up the phrase Antichrist. It's not, this term is not found in the book of Revelation. Did you know that? This is the only place that it's found. Now, John says that there is one Antichrist who's coming in the future, but he's preceded by many other Antichrists. And so here's the point. The sole purpose of the Antichrist is to deceive people from knowing the real Jesus. How many of you know that in our world today, there's a lot of opinions out there about who Jesus really is, right? There's a lot of opinions about who Jesus really is. So do you think it's possible that there are Antichrists living today? Absolutely there are. You know, was, he, was Jesus just a prophet, as the Muslims say? Was he just a man? Was he, 
100% God or not man at all? You know, the other question is, was he good or was he God? Was he the Savior or was he uh, just significant? Who was he? Who was Jesus? People freak out about sometimes the Antichrist coming, but here's some encouragement. Uh, by Daniel Aiken, who wrote a commentary on this book, he said this. He said, the rise of the Antichrist should not cause the believer to be dismayed or disheartened, but should be an encouragement because it is a sign that the return of Christ is imminent. As the gospel of Jesus spreads in the world, so are the false gospels going to spread. That's what John's telling us here. And so the more that Jesus and his truth is spread throughout the world, the more that the counter antichrist, the false Christ, and the false messages of Christ are going to spread in equal proportion. But if you think about it, what are the antichrists doing? They're actually slandering Jesus. They're slandering him. They're making up stuff about him or saying things about him that just aren't true. Now, if somebody was to slander my wife, or one of my kids, I'd get really upset. And, and if somebody slandered one of your family members or somebody who you love desperately, what would your first response be if someone was slandering them? You'd want to defend them, right? I would. And so if you hear somebody slandering Christ, what is your reaction? These are those little thermometer things we look at. It's like, like how much do I really love Jesus? When you hear somebody slander Jesus or make fun of him, or, 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 or propose that he's something that he's not, there should be something in your heart that is grieving, that is like, oh, that's my savior. That's, that's the lover of my soul who you're talking about right now. Unfortunately, more and more people in the church today are deconstructing their faith, as a popular term right now. Um, they'll say they're becoming ex-evangelicals because they no longer feel comfortable with the teachings of the church, because they want to create a Jesus that's in their own image. They want to create a Jesus that's comfortable for them. And if you're here today and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm someone who's deconstructing your faith, uh, first of all, I just want to say, I, I would love to have a conversation with you, and I, I want to validate your feelings. A lot of people in the church today just ha- are confused, and they're like, okay, I don't, I don't like the way that um, evangelicals have been communicating who Jesus is. And there are a lot of evangelicals today, I don't think, who are accurately representing Jesus and not ac- accurately representing a Jesus who is loving and compassionate. But my view is this, is that when a person really understands and really gets God's grace, you know, according to God's own word, like, I don't think that that person who is truly saved can, can deconstruct their faith in a way that they're no longer saved. I think deconstruction isn't always bad. I think it's sometimes it's a, what are you constructing around it? But a lot of times these people can be truly deceived. John 10, 27 to 28 says this. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Again, Jesus is talking about people who are truly saved. But if a person's only understanding of Jesus and the Bible is based around a set of rules or a code, a system, or a do and don't list, then I can totally understand why somebody would want to deconstruct their faith, because I would want to too. But that's not, that's not what Jesus is all about. And so I would encourage you, if, if you, if you know for certain that you have been saved and you have received grace into your heart, to not get distracted by the Antichrist who want to remove our view of who Jesus is. The Antichrist want to drag you away from the real Jesus and experiencing him. But why will this not happen to you? Verse 20, John says this. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. You know, this this is phrase, a word anointing, that we kind of throw around out there, like, God, anoint that person to do this, or anoint that person to to do this. It's, It's not a term that's used that often. But it is very, very important to understand. The word anointing just literally means, if you go back to the Old Testament, it's the same word in the New Testament here, that you uh, anoint somebody or you put oil on someone as a way of symbolically uh, setting that person apart for a specific assignment. And so when it's used in the New Testament, what they're talking about is that you have been anointed, you've been set apart, or you have been specifically assigned by God, commissioned by him, empowered by him to do a specific work. 
In the Old Testament, it was the prophets, the priests, and the kings that were anointed with the oil and set apart. But now, what John is saying is that you, all of you in this room who are a follower of Jesus, you have been anointed. Did you know that? You have been anointed. Look what 2 Corinthians 1, 21 to 22 says. The Apostle Paul says, Now it is God who strengthens us together with you in Christ and who has anointed us. He has also put his seal on us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a down payment. So my second point is this, is that we have been given a special assignment from God. What is your assignment? The assignment given to every single believer in this room today is this, is that two parts. One, you are to share and spread the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing is that you are to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to John and Paul, those are the things that we have been anointed by God to do. Did you ever think about that, that, that you have been assigned to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's like, I, I get the picture of like a king or queen. You ever see this, where they, they knight someone, or they take a sword and say, I dub thee now Sir Tyler. You know, and then, you know, go and defender of the realm. Well, what God is now doing is that he's saying, uh, I dub you Sir Dan, defender of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're kneeling before Jesus in that way. We kneel down, and he dubs us. He anoints us. He commissions us to go and to be not just spreaders of the gospel, but defenders of the gospel of Jesus. Then John goes on to say to those who are anointed, he says this. He says, I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because if you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? The spirit of the world is the Antichrist. And I will always deny who Jesus really is. I, I, I want to show a video, but I, I saw it once and I couldn't find it again. Um, but it was a man who's an apologist, a person who defends the faith. And, um, and he was invited to come speak or debate at this uh, atheistic um, gathering of people. And they said, hey, we want to let our leading atheist scientist uh, explain why God does not exist. Basically prove why God does not exist. And we're going to give you 20 minutes to then defend why you think God does exist. And, and the, the, the pastor apologist said, I don't need 20 minutes, but I, I'll take the time. And so the first guy gets up, the atheist gets up, and he's speaking to the crowd. And of course, they're all on his side. They're all there for him. They're all, they're all atheists. And, uh, and, they're all, and he was very eloquent and, and, and spoke his points. And then the apologist gets up, and he says to him, he, and he does this. He, he basically says, okay, let's just say for a second, if I drew a circle. He said, let's just say that that circle represents all that can be known in the universe. Right? In other words, everything that a person could discover about the universe is in this circle. He said to the man, uh, the, the atheist scientist, he said, out of that circle, how much do you think you know? And so the man said, was very generous to himself, and said, I probably know about this much. And so then what the apologist said, he said, well, all of this you're telling me is unknown. He said, do you think that God could somehow occupy that space? Is it possible you just admitted how much you don't know. <laughs> and yet you're telling us you know that God does not exist. And so this, and so he says, we said, was that, well, you are, he said, you are not an atheist. You're an agnostic, which means you don't know. And there's a big difference. A lot of people today say they're atheists, and they're not. They're actually agnostic. They just don't know. But they call themselves atheists because they don't know for sure. And so this, in this space, is where God reveals himself. Because we know so little. The reality is, of course, if you, this person wanted to say, how much do you actually know of the universe? It's more like a dot. That you, know, you probably couldn't even see that on the screen. It's a dot. That's, that's what actually is known. See, people are quick to deny who Jesus really is, not because of evidence, but because of accountability. That's our world. Most people that I talk to who don't believe in Jesus, don't believe in him, it's not because of evidence. It's because they don't want there to be accountability for how they live, if they're being honest with themselves. Or they just have a hard time reconciling morality, and they're just trying to figure all of that out. And so it's really important that we 
when, when you have those conversations with people, don't make them feel bad for not believing. You know, don't make them feel stupid because they don't believe what you believe. Just talk to them. Tell them your story. Tell them how God has changed your life. Tell them your miracle. See, antichrists deny Christmas. In other words, they deny the incarnation that God became flesh. That's what the antichrist denies. They, they would say Jesus, never, Jesus was not God. But back to 1 John 22, it says this. This one is the antichrist, the one who denies the father and the son. No one who denies the son has the father. He who confesses the son has the father as well. You see, the father and the son are a package deal. You can't get one without the other. And that's a beautiful thing for us. It's been said that it's better to be divided by a truth than united by an error. There's a lot of people in this world that are united by an error. But we have been anointed and commissioned to be bearers of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to defend it. And back to verse 28. So now, here he says again, little children, remain in him. He uses that phrase, remain in him, a lot. Remain in him so that when he appears, we may, be, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Jesus will appear, and what John is saying is that when he appears, we may have confidence so that when we see Jesus, we won't be like standing there with our trash and our soda cans and our uh, pizza boxes in our hands like, uh-oh. We will, we will stand before him in confidence because we know who we are. We know that we are God's children, that Jesus Christ has paid for our sins. We aren't just covered by his blood. We are cleansed by his blood. And we can stand before him in confidence and say, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We don't have to be afraid. I know so many people who are dreading Jesus coming back, Christians. And to me, it's like, I'm like, come, Jesus. I want you to come. Why do I want to hang on to this world any longer? This world is wonderful. There's a lot of wonderful things here. And God has given us and commissioned us to do amazing things while we're here. And I love this life. But this is nothing compared to where we're going. Jesus is preparing a place for us that's far better, according to his word, than what we could ever imagine. John says, remain in Jesus. So we have confidence when he returns. That word remains just means union and communion. In other words, it's not just like we're not just hanging out in his presence. We are communing with him. We're having a relationship with him right now. So point number three is this. A life that is at peace with the future is a life that is intertwined with Christ. So when Jesus returns, if I'm still here, I will be saying, yes. Not, uh-oh. Just think for a moment. If Jesus walked through the doors in the back right now, like in the flesh, and he walks up to the stage and says, hey, guys, I'm back. Now, it's not how it's going to happen. But if that happened, what's your first reaction? Is it like, is it like uh-oh, like I'm, I'm not ready? Or is it, yes. And, and to be honest, and I've been in different places of this in my life. If it's not, yes, then that is a really good thermometer indicator of what, how you are doing spiritually and the health of your soul. And I want to encourage all of you, if it's not that reaction of yes, then I would encourage you to press in to Jesus. I would encourage you to really just say, Jesus, I need you to start molding me and shaping me more into who you want me to be. When Jesus returns, the word says that he will point out whether or not we were ashamed of him or not. So another question is that, do people know that you're a follower of Jesus? Mark 8, 38 says, Jesus says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes into the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I remember, of, uh, oh gosh, about 10 years ago, I went to a, a Phillies game, but it was an away game, and it was in Washington, D.C. And I went with some friends from my church, and we said, okay, are we going to wear our Phillies t-shirts and our Phillies jerseys? We're, we, I, 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 I've been to Philadelphia games where visiting people had uh, beverages thrown on them, and different things happened to them. And I said, okay, guys, what are we going to do? Are we going to wear our Phillies paraphernalia uh, going into the Washington Stadium? But we decided to do so. And so we wore our, our Phillies gear. And, and it was a little bit weird. We heard a few comments from other people. But we were like, you know what? We're proud Phillies fans. We're going to wear our, our, Phillies, our Phillies shirts. 
But church, every day for us as the church is an away game. We are always, this is not our home. Every day is an away game. And so the question is, are we ashamed? Or are we wearing Jesus on our sleeve? Is Jesus who people see when they see us? We cannot be ashamed of him. 1 John 3, 1 says this, See what great love the Father has given to us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. If, if I'm ashamed of Jesus, if I'm ashamed of God and what he's done for me, what I'm saying is I'm ashamed of my family. I'm ashamed of my dad. I'm ashamed of my Savior. But John says right here that the reason you are his children is because of one reason and one reason alone. He loved you. But we're, we're incredibly insecure people, aren't we? I mean, I just think as human beings, we're very insecure. But John is telling us right here, we need to stop feeling inferior about ourselves and superior about ourselves. That the reason that we are what we are is simply because God loved us. And nothing more and nothing less. That's incredibly humbling. We don't pay some kind of fee to join some membership club that God uh, has. He just loved us. 1 John 3, starting verse 2, he goes on to say this. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. Now, I just want you to think about this for a second. We're God's children now, and what we're going to be hasn't yet been revealed. When I look at a child with my own children, and I, I, I remember when they were very little, I remember thinking, like, who are they going to become someday? Or what are they going to look like someday? You know, some kids, you can like, oh, I can tell what they're going to look like when they get older. And some kids are like, I have no idea. I have no idea what they're going to look like. A child is just a preview of the adult that's yet to come. I want to show you some pictures of some famous people for a second. Uh, let's put the first picture. So anybody want to guess who this is? This is a famous scientist, Albert Einstein. This is Albert Einstein. So you can put up his next picture, yeah. Now, obviously, obviously, this young boy turns into this person, right? You would have guessed that, right? All right, let's go to the next picture. Who's that? This one probably you can tell a little bit more. This is a very famous football player, Tom Brady. That's who he becomes. I, I, I know it's, I, I, I really struggle with using that one. Um, <laughs> the next one. This is Serena Williams, very famous tennis player, but that's who she, who she became. And then the last one might be a little bit harder. Anybody know? It's not me. <laughs> it's Pastor Wayne. <laughs> Now, you would never guess that that person would become that person. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Wayne, for letting us use that picture. <laughs> We're all children of God. The reason I'm showing this isn't just for fun. It's because we all, right now, all, I don't care how old you are, you are a child of God, and you are not yet who you will become. Isn't that good news? <laughs> that is good news to me, because I'm glad that I have not arrived, because I'd be worried. I'm glad that I have not yet arrived. What will we become? John goes on to say this. He says, we know that when he appears, we will be like him. Amen? Because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. This is the tension of the already but not yet part of being a Christian. We have been saved. We've been justified by God through the work of Jesus Christ and his blood on the cross. So we are saved. We have been born again. But we are not yet all that we will be someday. We will not fully be like Jesus until we see him face to face. So my, my point number four is this, is that we are a work in progress. Michelangelo, the famous artist, uh, not, the, not the Ninja Turtle, he said this. He said, no great work of art is ever finished. Now, that's true with just regular human art. But you are a work of art. I, I don't care what you think of yourself or how poorly you think of yourself. You are a work of art. That is the truth. That is the truth of God. You are a work of art, a divine painting that is still being painted. Until you see Jesus face to face. And then you're done. 
There's no more work that has to be done in you. When you see Jesus face to face, you are done. But look what Paul says in Romans 8. He says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And so we need to stop beating ourselves up for not being perfect. I, I, I wish we, should, we could all wear a T-shirt or those, those, maybe just wrap ourselves around that yellow construction tape that says, Under Construction. I feel like that's how we should see ourselves sometimes. Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, I want to make sure I'm very clear here. I'm not talking about the, the spirit, your spiritual position. You are saved if you are a follower of Jesus. You are justified by God, and you are in right standing with God. But he is still working in us. We have not yet arrived. He's still working in us. But the, in this pastor here, he says we will, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That day is the ending of the final hour that we talked about earlier that John mentioned. Now, one of my favorite things to do with my children as they were growing up was to read them bedtime stories. And uh, I, I almost, the fun thing about that was that I almost always knew the stories before they did. And when I would read them a chapter book or whatever it was, I, I, and if there were plot twists, I was kind of like, let me, let, me, let me read a little bit and then watch their reaction to see what, 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 what their response was to the, the plot twist or the thing that was revealed. But reading a bedtime story just often put them at ease. Sometimes they couldn't even go to sleep until I read to them. And it calmed their hearts. But here's the good news, is that God has read a bedtime story at night for all of us while it was dark. You ever think about this? God could have chosen to reveal his plan of salvation any way he wanted to. But he chose to do it through the narrative. He chose to tell us a story. And so the written word of God isn't just a list of rules. It's a story, isn't it? It's, this, it's a story of God and humanity, the story of his son and what he chose to do about our problem of sin. But God does not just invite us just to listen to the story. You think about like, this time of year, sometimes kids do Christmas pageants, and they'll, you have like the Mary and Joseph scene, and, and they'll, they'll, it's a play, like a Christian play. But God doesn't just invite us to watch the play. God says, I'm inviting you onto the stage, and I want you to join in the story. And that's what God's done for us. We are invited to join the story. Now, when we tell stories to children, we do it at appropriate stages, don't we? We, tell, we start with maybe a picture book, and then we move into like, you know, some words that they can understand about a caterpillar, and then they move up to chapter books. We do it in stages. And, uh, and, you know, and as they get older, they're reading novels. But the Christmas story, the story of the incarnation, for many of us, started as a little kid story, didn't it? For probably most people in this room, even if you didn't grow up a Christian, you knew about little baby Jesus in the manger. It's all over the place. But what we need to do now is we need to defend what the actual Christmas story is. The Christmas story isn't just a story of cute little baby Jesus in the manger with animals standing around him, is it? It's a little bit darker than that. Because if we were really accurately telling the story of Jesus coming to earth, there was a person named Herod who was trying to kill Jesus, and he massacred, massacred. Who knows how many baby boys in the Bethlehem area. That's part of the Christmas story, isn't it? But we don't see that necessarily represented always in our, our stories. And I think here's one of the problems I mentioned earlier about people who are deconstructing their faith, is that too often, whether it's the Christmas story or the story of Daniel or the story of Noah's Ark, it's, that's not just a story about saving cute little animals. That's a tragic story. And so it's really important that when, when most people who deconstruct their faith, who walk away from faith later on in life, the reason they did so is because the Bible was, in a, in a way, kind of, let's give them the easy, digestible version of what God's story is for us. And so they never had the hard truths confronted. And so I heard someone say this recently. It's better to give children big truths they can grow into than small truths they can grow out of. Let me read that again. It's better to give children big truths they can grow into than small truths they can grow out of. And so if you are a parent of your children, a parent children, if you're a parent and your children are still under your care, I encourage you, tackle the tough subjects 
including the tough parts of the Christmas story, with your children now. Don't wait. Don't rely on someone else to do so. Tackle them now. Because here's the problem, is that for many people in the world, Jesus, for them, is still in the manger. Never left the manger. That's the only concept of Jesus they have, is little baby Jesus in the manger. Because that's the one they're comfortable with. You know, we have a, a Playmobil nativity set that we have in our home, which is cute, and it's got a cute little scene of Christmas. But I looked. Playmobil doesn't sell a crucifixion set. Why? Because we mentioned last week, you know, the, the manger is really important, but the manger is nothing without the cross. Why don't they sell a crucifixion set? Oh, well, that's, that's a tough one. That, that's not going to sell as many action figures. But it, it's, in, it, it's, it's far more important as far as what, what it meant. Now, Jesus had to be born. You can't have one without the other. But it, it, this, this is why we have to make sure that we grow up and we, 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 as we're, we're little, little children, that we start growing into the story of what Jesus and the incarnation really means. To be clear, there's nothing wrong with celebrating baby Jesus. Baby Jesus is worth worshiping. <laughs> He's a miracle. But baby Jesus was born to die on the cross. In 1 John 3, John gives two reasons why Jesus came in the flesh. Verse 5, he says this. He said, you know that he was revealed. So here he goes. He was revealed, the incarnation, the, the manger so that he might take away his sins. And there is no sin in him. He was sinless. He was perfect. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. So little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was here it is, revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. So John tells us right there in that passage, there's two reasons why uh, Jesus was revealed in the flesh. Number one, take away the sins of the world. And number two, to destroy the devil's work. How many of you have ever built like an elaborate sandcastle on the beach? Anybody? Anybody ever do it? Like this is, this is one that I did. I'm surprised how quickly you all left at that. No, I did not, I did not, I did not build this. Uh, forgive me. Um, but imagine if someone built a sandcastle. That's amazing work, right? To me, though, think about it like this. This, is, this represents what Satan's done here. Has Satan worked hard on this earth? Yeah, he's worked hard. He's built a fortress for himself. But here's the truth, and here's, here's the good news, is that just like, you know, when you build a sandcastle, what, I remember doing it when the tide comes in, and it just washes it away. It's like, ah. You know, I did all that work for nothing. You know, but, but what happens is, is that Satan has built castles, sand castles. And one day, the tide of Jesus comes in. It's like, boom. So that's what happened when Jesus was revealed. He, the tide of his blood, the tide of, of the cross came in and destroyed the devil's work. It's gone. There's no, there's no evidence of a sand castle once the tide has come in, is there? It's just gone. And that's what is going to happen, or that is what has happened with Jesus and his work on the cross. And that is good news. Now, John said that if we are truly God's children, we won't sin anymore. Is that what he said? No. He did not say that. But he said, uh, he said, he said um, last week we talked about, like he said, but if you do sin, if, he said, if you do sin, then how, but but we, we, we juxtapose that with what John's saying, though, is that but if you are a true follower of Jesus, it's like it's going to be really hard to do so. And so we need to figure out well, how, does this, how does this all work together? How do I live that life that is opposing sin, that we don't sin anymore? John's, of course, not expecting Christians to be perfect. What John is saying, though, is this. He's saying that sin no longer defines you. You are a saint who sometimes sins, but sin no longer rules your life. See, there's a time before, before you are born again, before you're a follower of Jesus, sin doesn't bother you as much. In fact, you could say, I like sin. Now, we can still momentarily like sin, which is why we do it. But in my heart, you ask me, what do I really feel about sin? I hate sin. But before I was saved, I wouldn't say that. And so what John is saying here is that sin no longer has control over you. Sin no longer rules 
and, and dominates your destiny. We're saints who stum sometimes stumble, but we're never lost. So, the hour is late. The question for all of us is that, are you ready? And so whether you put your faith in Jesus Christ before, maybe you never have. I would just encourage you, if you've never made that decision, that make that decision today. Or, if you are a follower of Christ, but the thought of his return scares you, then I encourage you to get right with him today. See, God has taken his children, he's tucked us into bed at night, and he's told us a bedtime story, he's told us a children's story. The prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah 9, 2 says this, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. We were, we were living in a dark world. We were blind, but now we see. And that's what Jesus has done for us. So the, Jesus, Jesus was the light of the world. So the question for all of us today is, is, is this, is that do you feel lonely? Do you feel like you're lost or still in darkness? So this is the beautiful thing about the gospel. The gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, isn't just for people who don't believe. We need to all hear it all the time, don't we? Because we, we live like we forget it. I do it sometimes. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is for those of you who don't believe, but could. Those of you who believe, but are struggling. Those of you who believe but feel good about your faith because then you realize, oh, I gotta, keep, I gotta keep sharing this. It's for all of us on every stage of our lives, no matter where you are, God meets you right where you are. So what we're gonna do is, if we could just posture our hearts before him right now. And we ask you right now, Holy Spirit, that you would just come as our counselor. To, your word says, your Holy Spirit, you are our counselor. Lead us and guide us, and I pray that you would just counsel us right now. I pray that you would speak to every heart here. We're all in a different place right now. But we're all your children. None of us have arrived. None of us have become yet who we will be one day. Jesus, we thank you that you are patient, you are kind, and you are shaping us. God, I pray that you would adjust our perspective right now, that we would no longer focus on our mistakes, either the past or today, but our focus will be fixed on the fact that you have called us children of your love. And if there's anyone here in this place today who's not yet put their faith in you, Jesus, I pray right now that you would just lovingly stir in their hearts. Speak their name. Call to them, Lord. And I pray they would, they would respond. Just remain in the spirit of worship and, and prayer. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song. And let this song be you speaking to your own heart, as David did often in the Psalms. And speak to the Lord.
every person here, every person watching online, Lord, with just a greater revelation of your truth. Lord, we are so quick to listen to other things and other words that have been spoken over us, but right now I pray that in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would break off any lie that has been spoken over us, any lie that we've spoken to ourselves, and that you would just bring freedom in this place, freedom in our hearts, to fully receive the fact that we are your children. That is no light thing. And God, I pray that we would live like children of the King, that we would be defenders of the gospel, that we would be spreaders of the gospel and your good news and your love, that you, as you have anointed us, God, that we would go not on our own strength, but in power as people who are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ himself, that we go with your your spirit inside of us. Lord, you have anointed us. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I I pray right now that truth and the 
truth of your love would reign above every thought in our minds. That every thought that enters our ears and goes through our brain would be subservient and filtered through that idea and that truth that we are your children because you love us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.